Hello and welcome to Truck Stop Murder and True Crime Pod. I am your host Gary Howard. This is my second episode. My first episode was about Wendy Odrana, Aldrano, and I had my guest Lindsay Anderson with me on that episode. On this episode, we're t- we'll bring you to Louisiana. But before we begin, I'm going to start you know, tell a little bit about myself. I am a truck driver, over the road truck driver that also has an interest in true crime and murder and different things like that. And I go to all, I spend most of my life at these truck stops. So I decided with my, you know, interest in, you know, what goes on through people's minds and stuff like true crime murder. Ever since I met my wife, I was really got into true crime, true crime and really, you know, I want to say a fascination, but an interest in it. So with the, this being said so i decided to start looking around these different truck stops i stayed at and see if i could find any kind of craziness last week well a couple weeks ago i was in phoenix at the flying j there that's where i found whitney odrano and just recently i have came across this individual when i was coming off a home time right after new year's eve I picked up a load in Houston and headed to outside of by Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and uh, picking up a load in St. Francisville, Louisiana, where I do stop at a lot. By the um, a truck stop right there, I can't think of the name of it. Bella Truck Stop and Casino, Southern Bella Truck Stop and Casino. Right there, it's a old gravel parking lot, but it's not too bad if you need a place to park. And while I was there, I came across this individual. When I was looking up, Derek Todd Lee, the Baton Rouge Shield Killer, where he started early as a peeping Tom and animal torturer and went into becoming a serial killer that, you know, stalked the cities of Baton Rouge for a long time where the police was had no idea who it was. In fact, at the beginning of the research, they were actually looking for the wrong person. But come to find out, they eventually will find him, and he will be convicted of his crimes. So let's talk a little bit about Derek Tali. Derek Tali, known as the Baton Rouge Shield Killer, proud communities of South Louisiana for years before his capture, eventual conviction of two of the seven cases of rape and murder of women to which he was linked to by DNA. He was suspected to be in a range of brutality from 1992 to 2003. So a little bit about his childhood. Lee was born November 5th, 1968 in St. Francisville, Louisiana to Samuel Ruth and Florence Lee. His father left Florence soon after Derek was born. For her, the children having Ruth out of the picture was a good thing. He suffered from mental illness and ended up in a mental institution after being charged with the attempted murder of his ex-wife after he left Derek's mom. So not too long after that, league, Florence later married Coleman Barrow, a responsible man who raised Derek and his sister as they were his own children. Together they taught their children the importance of the education and the Bible. Being in the South, of course, the Baptist is running wild in this case. So, But Lee grew up like many children in small towns around South Louisiana. His neighbors were and PayPal's are mostly his extended family, cousins, and whatnot. So, he, so did he pretty much hang around there, and later find out he was kind of a weird person. So, it was probably best his interest to hang out with people that he didn't know. But and as for school-wise, his interest in school was limited to playing in the school band, because he he struggled academically. After being outshined by his younger sister, who was a year younger than he had but advanced in school faster, his IQ at that point was calculated between 70 and 75, making it a challenge for him to maintain his grades. So now here where we, we start his crimes. So by the time Lee turned 11, he had already been caught peeping in windows of girls in the neighborhood, which if you remember what I said was a lot of his neighborhoods consist of family. So he was actually peeping in on his cousins at the time which I guess that's all he knew, but still is not right. <laughs> which he continued to do so as an adult. He also, back to the torturing animals, I felt because he, because his dad kind of beat him with his mental illness and stuff like that. So he figured, 
since he was beaten by himself by something bigger, most serial killers like the dominance over small animals. So that's where a lot of serial killers start at. So at the age of 13, Lee was arrested for simple burglary. He broke into a candy shop. He, he would, by that time, the police already knew him because of his voyeurism, but it wasn't until he turned 16 where his anger got him into real trouble. He pulled a knife on a, on a boy during a fight and was charged with attempted second degree murder. So his rap sheet was beginning to fill up and I could not find it. I looked a few times, but being a juvenile, there's really not much stuff on this area right here. So at age 17, Lee was arrested uh, for being a peeping Tom yet again. But even though he was a high school dropout, so he was not in school no more, with multiple complaints and arrests, he avoided to stay in juvenile detention. So, on to his marriage. So he's, in 1988, Lee met and married Jacqueline Denise Sims. He, they had two children, the boy named after his father, Derek Lee Jr. And in 1992, a girl named Doris Lee. Soon after marriage, Lee held guilty to unauthorized entry to inhabit. So he's breaking into still break, but there's nobody there, but still he had no business being there. So then after a few years, he drifted in and out of two different worlds. There's two Derek Tallies. In one, he was a responsible father who worked hard at his construction job and took care of his family on week and outings. In the other, he cruised the town local bars you know, dressing nice, drinking, and planning external affairs, cheating on his wife. Where that's where he had eventually ran into a, a girlfriend he had on the side named Cassandra Green. But Jacqueline knew about his friend, she knew about it all, but she was devoted to him. She did not want to leave him. You know, she really stayed true to them wet marriage files. She became used to him also being arrested, but the time spent he in prison was almost a welcome relief because like I said earlier his dad tortured him he tortured animals and he you know transitions this violent atmosphere to his family so when he was at home that just meant he wasn't getting having issues the family was not having issues with them so in 1996 Jacqueline's father was killed in a plant explosion and she was awarded a quarter of a million dollars so oh my god now he got some money with the financial boost, Lee can now dress better, buy cars, and spend more money on his girlfriend, like I told you, Cassandra Green, where he was met at a bar. But he blew through money as quickly as it came. So by 1999, Lee was back to living on his earned wages, although now he had another mouth to feed. So now this girlfriend, his girlfriend, Cassandra, so this is the other woman, gave birth to their son, whom they named Dietrich Lee. So now he has a son named Derek Lee and Dietrich Lee in the July of that year. So let's see one of his victims that he came across. Because what he do, he was study, you know, he's already known for peeping Tom, peeping out, hanging out windows. So come Colette Walker. So in June of 1999, Colette Walker, 36, of St. Francisville, where so f that's where Derek's from, filed stalking charges against Lee after he muscled his way in her apartment and tried to convince her that they should date and he was not taking a no for an answer so she did not know him so he after a few days of stalking her he finally just asked her questions hey you know this person you knew this person finally he just made his way in because she wasn't buying it so she finally she when he got there he eased her out eased them out told him he had to go but he left his phone number and just suggested that she call him Days later, a friend who lived near Colette asked her about Lee, whom she had been lurking around the apartment. Uh, you see? <laughs> On another occasion, Colette caught him peeping into her window and called the police. But even with his history of being a peeping Tom, plus various other arrests, Lee did not do little time for charges of stalking and unlawful entry in a plea bargain. Lee pled guilty and received probation. Against the directions of the court, he again went looking for Colette, but she had moved. She had to get away from this guy. So with all that going on, life has become pretty stressful for Lee. Since his money was gone, his finances were tied, he was arguing with Cassandra, his girlfriend, a lot. 
in February 2000, the finally escalated to, the finally finally escalated to violence. She started having a protective order against her, prevent, preventing Lee from getting near her. Three days later, he was caught up with her in the bar parking lot and violently assaulted her. So Cassandra pressed charge and his probation was provoked. He spent the following year in prison until the release of February 2001. He was placed under house arrest and required to wear a monitoring bracelet. So in May, he was found guilty of violating the terms of his parole by removing the equipment. Instead of having the probation revoked, however, he was given a legal slap on the hand and now not returned to prison. Once again, the opportunity to remove Lee from society was lost. So, when Lee committed his first and last rape of murder, of course, it was un to his unspecting women, it's really unknown when he started or where he ended. What is known is on April 2nd, 1993, he allegedly attacked two teens who were necking in the parking car in a parked car equipped with a six foot harvesting tool. I don't know if you know what a harvesting tool is, but it's pretty much a weed sickle. So he came in here looking like the Grim Reaper, you know, swinging and swinging, trying to kill these people. And he was accused of hacking the couple, stopping and fleeing only when he only stopped when, when another car was approaching. So he took off them. The couple survived and six, later, six years later, the girl, the girl, Michelle Chapman, of course, picked him out of a lineup as her attacker, but the Statue of Limitations had already ran out. So these brutals lasted 10 years after that attack with the DNA, of course, with, like I said, DNA evidence eventually connecting to that. But if they would have got them then, we wouldn't be talking about these other things that I'm about to discuss with you. So, the first victim, well, not the first victim, but th this is the one that eventually got on, you know, with the first degree murder. But we'll get into all to that. So, let's talk about the victim. Ch Charlotte Murray Pace. Charlotte Murray Pace. She was a, a pretty 22-year-old who had just graduated from LC LSU as one of the youngest recipients of the MDA degree. Her family and friends called her Murdy. After graduating LSU, she continued her graduate work with the LSU Alumni Association to her job in Atlanta in the firm of, I can't pronounce these words, Deloitte and Touche, <laughs> who would begin later that summer. But on Friday, May 31st, 2002, after leaving her graduate work, Pace washed her newly acquired BMW, approximately 11.52, and then went to her Benton Rouge the townhouse that she shared with Rebecca Yeager, a close friend for six years to wait Rebecca's scheduled arrival of about 1 p.m. Pace and them were planning on going to Alexandria, Louisiana, Alexandria, Louisiana to attend a weekend wedding at Grace Church a, with, of a former roommate. When, so when Rebecca arrived at 2 p.m., uh, the horror she found was unspeakable. She found Pace's almost completely new body lying on the floor between the bedroom door and the bed. She observed blood all over the room, on the furniture, and all over the, f the floor. The bed was made, but the bedspreads were soaked in blood. She later found blood in the kitchen and in the hallway in the bedroom. She saw, so in the hallway, so it, it looked like it had started from the front and progressed to the bedroom, through the hallway where she was drugged. She saw Pace had some small holes in her chest and stomach, and Pace's throat was cut open. Unable to find the townhouse's portable phone, when they still had landlines, Rebecca used her cell phone and called 911, where operator, 911 operator, and then flagged the police car down and asked for assistance. So with the assistance of the crime lab, they took swabs from different parts of her body in different, you know, as in, you know, any kind of places where any kind of sexual DNA might be, as in, you know, the rib, they took swabs from the rib cage, swab from her left buttock, which was just below her vagina, and another swab from her left thigh, where all these were signs 
where they used the alternate light source where they put on her because once they get, the scene was closed down they left everything where it was they did not disturb the body and everything they, they put bags over the hands to make sure there's any kind of evidence DNA evidence underneath the fingernails which later they did find and they did with the light they did find the semen that majority the semen around her different body parts they also found an iron in close proximity to the body and the base of the iron the heating element part of it was stained and the majority of iron iron <laughs> including the handle and cord was missing after investigators team gathered the individual pieces of evidence labeled each according to protocol they submitted to the specimens to Baton Rouge police to, who logged all evidence to the crime lab and during the autopsy so they got it clear autopsy reported that 81 different wounds two bodies pace and an open that cause of death was ex extinguishation e x a s a n x sanguation <laughs> i'm sorry he theorized that the two patterns of stab booms were present one resembling lessons caused by a flat screwdriver the other res resembles like from a knife he also found Pace sustained blood injuries to her head and a fractured skull, blood trauma to the eyeballs, together with multiple bruises to upper and lower extremities. The heart and liver were also punctured three times each. There was a swab bob and there was also a stab boom in her eyeball. So he was stabbing, beating, and penetrating the eyeball where a left area of the eyeball that penetrated into the canal cranial cavity which fractured the left frontal bone and so it was just pretty definitely a, a, a brutal attack but the autopsy report they cut me that was they took pictures of where there was a number of defensive wounds so she wasn't going down easy so there's a lot of defensive rooms so it was a battle paces arms forearms hands and wrists inflicted that she attempted to ward off the assailant but was not able to so finally, at June 13, 2002, her DNA analysis evidence she obtained the crime scene from the free nails obtained during the autopsy. autopsy. Although uh, they detected seminal fluid of swabs from Pace's left buttock in the vaginal area, she obtained the most of the DNA from her left buttocks, which she came up with a, a really good data, where the DNA data banks maintained. She found a good, clear DNA test but once it was submitted, they could not find DNA. They looked at the banks, they maintained at the local, state, and national levels, but she failed to identify a consistent profile with this DNA profile already logged in the system. Pace's rape and murder remained unsolved during this time. So, but at the time of Pace's rape and murder, there was other unsolved mysteries and rapes and murders from women of Baton Rouge and the Lafayette area which caused the police to further investigate the homicide. Indeed, some of the time later, the DNA analyst from the state police lab compared notes to the DNA samples recovered from several victims that was unsolved homicides already. It showed a single perpetrator had committed the unsolved homicides of these women as well. So the DNA matched from this woman to the ones that was already going on in the area that had been unsolved. The picture, so they deemed him a serial killer from that point on and they from there they called him the ghost of Baton Rouge so as I was saying they had um, numerous unsolved murders that was already in the neighborhood so let's jump back to September 24 2001 eight months prior to Pace's death Gina Wilson Green an attractive successful registered nurse 40 years of age who was found strangled and raped just three days away from Murray's townhouse so they were connected in some way so they he probably saw them both this and you know working but just picked this time was right to get which one and like um, I didn't mention this but the other case with um that there was no sign of force entry was evident the lead investigator lead detective opinion that although Green's body was found in her bed, a struggle appeared to have begun in the hallway. He said in the hallway there were large stains later determined to be fecal matter, a clump of hair, and Green's earrings were 
were separated a good distance from the floor. Her shoes were found in different rooms. Crime scenes personnel bagged the blouse green was wearing, logged in evidence, and committed it to the crime line. Green sword as well as her purse and cell phones were missing. Though the assistance of the singular wireless green cell phone provider, police officers recovered these items dumped behind a warehouse on, in Baton Rouge. In addition to these items, the police also recovered a kitchen towel that appeared to be from Green's house. So, they did the test on all this stuff. The expert DNA analyzed the crime line, obtained a complete DNA profile from the spot of blood recovered from the back elbow of Green's house blouse. Consistent DNA profile was found from this thing, but like before, they they didn't have nothing on the banks to see who this was and who this wasn't. So DNA profiles from Green and Pace murderer compared the DNA results these re respective cases. Immediately, it became apparent to them the results the DNA samples they immediately examined in the respective cases indicated a single perpetrator committed these two homicides. So they're together. So here's and then on July he strikes again on July 9, 2002. Diane Alexander, an attractive nurse, was attacked by was attacked at her home in Bio Bridge, about 45 minutes west of Baton Rouge, in a rural South Martin Parish. On the morning of July 9th, Alexander was getting ready for work when a black man who identified him keep remember this person right here because she's going to come up in a big part later on in the story who identified him so he knocked on he, Alexander was getting ready for work when a black man who identif identified himself as Anthony knocked on her door knocked on her front door asking for directions to Montgomery's when Alexandria says she did not know the Montgomery's the man asked to use the telephone he didn't ask her if her husband might know the Montgomery's. Then when she eventually informed him that her husband was not at home, the stranger demeanor quickly changed. He forced his way into the mobile home and overpowered her. The intruder caught her by the throat, told her not to try anything funny because he was armed with a knife and he would poke her in the eye. <laughs> poke her in the eye. And this guy got some... And then when attempted to rape her, but he could not maintain an erection. So he was not ready to go. So he got pissed off. He started bludgeoning her and attempted to strangle her with the telephone cord that he cut from the home computer that was close to him. And luck Alexander placed her, placed her hand between the telephone cord when he tried to strangle her in the neck to effect to stop the strangulation. She was passing out and out of consciousness when her son came home. Herman arrived at the residence. When the intruder heard Herman's car pull up on the driveway, the attacker ran out the back door. Herman saw the familiar car at the patient's home. He described it as a gold Mitsubishi Eclipse with a Hampton Hazard plate on the front of it. Further note, it had a dent in the hood. He also observed the, the telephone line cord hanging from the car's window. So when he entered the room, Herman found his mother on the floor laying in a pool of blood, Alexander had a skull fracture and was rushed via helicopter to a Lafayette hospital where she remained for five days. Crime scene personnel at the parish secured evidence from the scene and attack. Two significant items were preserved and logged into evidence for future forensic analysts. It served the end of the telephone cord that was cut from the computer and Alexandria's dress which DNA was evidence. But because this was a simple attack and not a rape and murder they really did not connect these to the other cases and I didn't mention that the other cases they were not looking for a black man they were looking for a white man because to that point black men were not known for serial killers if it was just one murder but since they were connected they just assumed it was a white man right off the bat and that's what they were looking for and they did not even connect this person so Alexander did give this detailed description to her attacker to the detective at the parish. Though her description a composite sketch of the attacker was made, the evidence from this crime scene, the sketch from both, which was a striking, I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry if y'all heard that I have a ring t- I forgot to put my phone on silent and that's a, that's a I listened to a podcast called Time Suck and I got some of his ring toes so I got if you heard that the big hip 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 yeah 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 I gonna get I got a message but that will not happen again I turned him down so where was I so Alexandria gave a detailed description of her attacker to the detective of the parish though her description and composite sketch of attacker was made evidence from the scene and the sketch bore a striking resemblance of the defendant would later become vital to resolving like I was saying the perpetrator was an unsolved homicide of the women of Baton Rouge and Lafayette but despite the evidence sketch at the, at the time the investigators Leads were focused on an unknown white male driving a white pickup truck. And so they were looking totally wrong. In the wrong person, wrong vehicle, and everything. So just three days after Alexandria's attack, Pamela Pigel Kimor, a beautiful 44-year-old antique shop owner, was reported missing from her Baton Rouge home. On July 12, 2002, Kimor's husband, Brian, arrived at her home in Bragmord place at 11:45, he found a full bathtub, spots of blood on the bedroom rug, and a minor dis- dissolving of the bedroom furniture. His wife Pam was not at home. Three days later, July 16, 2002, a survey crew found a body just south of the Whiskey Bay exit on I-10. Crime investigators also found a piece of telephone cord a few hundred feet from the body later forensic analysts would have matched the piece of cord to the cut from Alexandra's house that was earlier. The body which had been exposed to three days of summer heat was initially unidentifiable. Only through dental records was the body identified as belonging to Pamela Peglia Kinemore. So autopsy revealed that Kinemore had been strangled and three significant cut wounds five and a half five or four inches long were evident in on her neck. These neck wounds would cut through the skin, the windpipe below the, the larynx, and opening the airway open, pretty much cutting her neck in half. Of course, a sexual kit was utilized during this physical evidence, forceful penetration of it. He, he, no, I'm not going to get details, where, but you, you get the idea. I mean, he utilized everything. Defensive injuries was also seen on Kilmore's left hand and the right hand, the left elbow and the back of the forearm and the back of the arm and knees. So she was trying to fight this guy off. But although although the profile did not proceed a complete set of markers because of the body deterioration, it was significantly evident to everyone that Kilmore's attack was the same person who attacked during the pace. Therefore, police realized that they were looking for the same perpetrator on these three girls so they're trying to track down this killer so we're we're down to three girls already that this guy and they still have no clue who's doing this and then on November 21st 2002 Teresa Trinicia Dean Coleman attractive 23 year old woman disappeared from her Lafayette home. Her car, purse, and keys were found in Grand to- near the cemetery where she was visiting her mom. This is where she, she had went to visit her mom where she was buried at, apparently seven months earlier. Three days later, a hunter found Coma's body in the woods near Scotts, Louisiana. She was, carrying only, she was wearing only a t-shirt, bra, socks, and tennis shoes. Investigators found a pair of fleece pants and a pair of underwear and an underbrush near the body. A plume of blood about 30 feet from the body was found and there was evidence that a body was dragged through the mud to this location by the hunter. A forensic pathologist determined that Coleman died of blunt force trauma to the head. So it well, appears that she was looking at the gravesite when the perpetrator, well, as we know is Derek Tali, had snuck up behind her so hopefully I mean, it's not good as it happened, but, but he attacked, it may, she did not see it coming. Hopefully he just knocked her out. It'll be better. There he is again. <laughs> I'm sorry. The profile was, so they did a DNA test on this, and the profile was consistent with the DNA profile generated in green, paste, and chemistry. So they were all connected. 
So now, like I said, they are looking for a serial killer. Let me turn, make sure I turn this off again. Phone drive me crazy. Damn, Dan. Lastly, <laughs> on March 3rd, Lee Ellis statement reported his girlfriend, another person reported his girlfriend missing, Carrie Yonder. A beautiful 26-year-old graduate student at LSU disappeared from her home near campus. Stanton reported that he entered the residence throughout the un through the unlocked window. After entering the residence, he discovered the front door unlocked. After then, a key holder that was a screw, a broken necklace, and a small amount of blood on Yetter's purse, there was no indication of struggle on this time. After Dave's assertion, a commercial fisherman found Yeager's body March 13th in 2003 a partial, in Whiskey Bay, where her body was has been found. Upon a forensic exams and complete autopsy, it was determined that Yoder was raped, strangled, beaten, and stomped. A sexual a kit was done on her as well. DNA profile obtained from the vaginal washing was the same as Natasha Pold the DNA analyst who examined was the same. The DNA profile, the person in person of interest identified was consistent with the DNA profiles obtained in the Green, Pace, Kinemore, and so the DNA matched all four of these. But yet they were still nowhere no closer because there's no evidence of break in. They have a DNA profile on this individual, but of course like I said they're looking for a white individual not a black man and the white car and a white truck clearly he was not driving a a truck so although the forensic evidence pointed to a serial killer police had no match on the dna profile so there was nothing on the files in this person you know either local state or national levels so in the meantime the task force expanded search behind looking for a white male pickup truck because a floor forensic, you know, so they sent it out to nationwide the DNA. So in the meantime, so instead of just keeping a state, they did nationwide DNA test where they had sent it to Florida. So like I said, in the meantime, the task force expanded search beyond for looking for a white male in a white pickup truck because a Florida man described he, the, the lab test determined from several wear markings in the DNA that might suggest that this person is African American there's the first sign that they were looking for the wrong person so they start thinking about this so we're looking at all these evidence different areas where like the dead maybe we should start looking for living what you know may, may connect this the same motive same profile whatnot so they remembered this person of Diane Alexander which I remembered she's luckily for her she was the only one to survive lucky she did otherwise who knows how long Derek Lee would have went on with his killing rap page. So they went back to Derek, Diane Alexander again with Detective Boyd at the same at the parish, the St. Martin Parish Sheriff's Officers. Reviewed the sketch that was the first produced from description of the black assaultant, modified it only to adjust the hairline to show a razor's edge. So for the first time, the task force joined the St. Martin's Parish Sheriff's Office to broadcast Alexander's sketch and her son's Herman description of the attacker fleeing the vehicle and a print the sketch and everything so as details more fully became apparent the task force began receiving calls almost immediately after publication of An Alexander's composite drawing and the car description all callers identified the defendant as the assaultant portrayed in Alexander composite drawing so they all said we know this guy his name is Derek Tali. We have a history with him. And with the DNA profile out just afterwards on May 25, 2003, they completed an analyst of the, all the swabs submitted by the Zachary Police Department. Polls and analysts identified the defendant as the individual, individual whose DNA profile was consistent. So they ran the part DNA of the case of Alexandria was Alexander was it Diane was him. And they found out the DNA was the same as Gina Wilson Green, Charlotte Murray Pace, Pamela Pigla Kinemore, Trinisha Dean Coleman, and Carrie Yotter. So now they got their man. 
they got. Even though they, they were unable to locate him at first, they know who he is. Even though the task force was initially unable to locate this individual in the St. Francisville home on May, on May 26, 2003, his close relatives has released the, it was chose to release defendant's identification to, as a serial killer. On May 27, 2003, Chris J. Johnson of the East Baton Rouge Paris Homicide Detective, assisted by the FBI and U.S. Marshals, and Atlantic Police Department arrested the defendant in Atlanta, Georgia. So he had left soon, not too long after, I couldn't find out not too long after he was questioned about that, you know, they had the DNA. Well, we'll get in that later. The defendant did not consent his extradition. He did not consent his extradition to Louisiana. So after defendant's arrest and pursuit to a court ordered, blood was drawn from defendant with further DNA testing. The Louisiana State Police Lab analyzed the blood drawn from the defendant and determined that the likelihood of randomly finding another individual with this defendant having the same genetic profile was one in three point six trillion. So they got their man. So they they brought him back. He was extradited back to Louisiana, and his case. There's a bunch of things about his case. First, this thing was about his case was he decided that he wanted motions to suppress the DNA because he said it was not taken with the, it was, was the basis of the state's argument was six to six subpoenas. With such warrants are equivalent because both requires review by national mitigations. However, well, let me start this all over again because that didn't make no sense. He argued that because his he did not have no warrant that should be probable cause to get, but it was subpoenaed. But I'm not going to get too much in that. But they said no, no, no. We, I mean, we don't need a warrant. It was a subpoenaed. Your DNA was requested through subpoena, which the only thing they need for the subpoena is probably is uh, okay assuming the here we go so assuming the correctness of the state's argument on this point we nevertheless find it not present the trial court sufficient fact to support a finding of probable cause for the lawful insurance of a warrant in present case the state based its request for a subpoena on five factors so this is where, I, where he, they were able to get to his DNA or sample. Defendant had been arrested years before on a peep and tom charge in the subdivision in which the two victims and Zachary had been abducted and murdered. Defendant had an excessive criminal record and involved arrest charges and other convictions for burglary, attempted burglary, stalking, aggravating battery, trespassing, peep and tom charges, both defendant and his girlfriend indicated he had occasion to drive past. He he usually passed drove past all these people's victims. Occasion drive past Randy McMurray's subdivision the night she disappeared. Defendant was not incarcerated at the time of the abduction murder of the two Zachary victims or any other serial killer victim. And five defendant informed police five of the friends five friends. Defendant informed police that the defendant had told him the police were harassing him about the disappearance of a Zachary woman just two days after the disappearance of McMurray's disappearance. So we won't go too much more about that. He's saying that he should be his DNA DNA, DNA should not be submitted to court, but they said no, we, it's going to stay there. So his next motion was to change the venue. Because, because keep in mind this has been going on for years with you know serial killer so a lot of people know about it. he's stating that he would not get a fair trial where he was at you know there would be no bias you know jury of course that was rejected and defense funding another thing was defendant next could contends a trial court denied him adequate funds to mount the defense and deprive him of effective assistance of counseling specifically Defendant claims that 37000 he received was far less than two hundred. So he's saying he needs 216000 to need to secure you know, necessary experts. Which that's, I mean, as long as the, the prosecution spend that much money, it's only fair that the defendant also gets that much money. But he said he was not getting that much. So they, they disagreed on that. So, and the guilt phase with Charlotte Pace. 
Gina Wilson with Charles, well, we'll go, go there with Gina Wilson Green, who died on September 24, 2001 at home, three doors down from Pace's former resident in her bedroom, Manu Slaughtered. Pamela P Kinmore, who had been kidnapped from Baton Rouge home at night of July 12, 2002, whose body the police found four days later dumped in Whiskey Bay and with her throat cut. Carrie Yotter, kidnapped from her Baton Rouge home, March 3, 2003, when, whom the police found 10 days later, also dumped in Whiskey Bay, apparently one mile from where Kinnemore's body was recovered. A victim of manual strangulation, tr I'm, no, I'm sorry, I apologize about some of these names. I'm not the best speaker. I hate um, messing up these, you know, victims' names like I am. But Trachinchia Dean Coleman, Abducted from her car on November 2nd, 2002 in Scott, Louisiana, whose body the police found on November 24th, 2002, bludgeoned to death in the wooded area some distance away from her abandoned vehicle. And of course, Diane, Diane Alexander, who survived the attack in Baton Rouge home on July 9th by the Sultan who tried to rape and strangle her and fled the trailer with her only when her son arrived. So with all the testimony from the investigating detectives, forensic DNA experts, and various other witnesses, the crime evidence of the present case is spread over 600 pages of testimony. Slightly over half the testimony presented during this guilt phase, as in the Pace homicide, the state principally utilized DNA evidence to conduct defendant all other of conduct defendant to all the other homicides. With that being said, on June 25, 2003, an East Baton Rouge Parish jury, grand jury indicted defendant Derek Talley with the May 31, 2002 first-degree murder of Charlotte Murray Pace. The defendant's jury trial commenced on September 13, 2004, and pres presentation of evidence ended on October 12, 2004, after hearing close closing arguments at the conclusion of the guilt phase, receiving the tri trial court's instructions and deliberated defendant's guilt. The jury returned a unanimous verdict of guilty of the first degree murder. At the conclusion of the penalty phase, the jury unanimously returned a verdict of death. Find the defendant committed the aggravated rape of the victim. The trial court sends defendant to death according to the jury verdict and denied the finished motion for a new trial on December 10th, 2004. So a decree for the reason assigned here on the defendant's conviction of death sentence was affirmed. The judgment became final as a direct review when either the defendant fails to petition timely of the United States Supreme Court for certain criteria or the court denies his petition for criteria well CER criteria either our defendants haven't filed been denied fails to pension United States course timely prevent rules were here saying blah 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 so he just failed at everything that he needed to do so there you go Derek Lyle sitting there on death row in Baton Rouge but on J January 16th 2016 Lee was 47 was transferred to Lane Memorial Hospital in Zachary, Louisiana for emergency treatment and died of heart disease on January 21st. So the state was not able to execute him. I mean, I guess the verdict is still the same. Derek Tali is no longer on this planet. Thank God to harass and bother any women. But remember his son, Derek Tali? Well, later on, he, I guess, father like son, I guess this is a trifecta of killering. But later on, his son, remember Derek Tali, he was arrested for accidental fading shooting in East, also there too. But to make it just short, it was all accidental in this case because they were making a little rap video and they want to take some posters with a gun and they start kind of like pointing at each other. But they didn't really verify if the weapon was loaded or empty. Come to find out it was empty. And he shot his friend. But that's still ongoing. And hopefully maybe we'll see what happens. 
But if you like that story, hopefully you did. It's kind of choppy right now. I'm just getting started. Trying to get, I had planned on a, a co-host with me, but you know, different things and everything. You know, people have their own life, and sometimes they just can't do things. You know, they just can't do it. So I had to re, you know, fix me. You know, readjust, as I should say in the army. But if you do listen to this and you do find it entertaining, please follow my close group Facebook page at Truck Stop Murder on Facebook. I'm always happy we ain't got a few people there. I'm happy to have you join me. Or you can just follow me on Facebook or on Instagram and Twitter. It's Gary Howard 5 or anything. I'll put try to put links on here if I can figure this out. Also, if you want, if you like what you hear or just want to get me started or just give me a big fuck you, you'll find me on iTunes and CastBox right now. I believe Podbean right now. Like I said, this is a work in progress. I'm trying to figure this thing out. Hopefully, you bear with me on this. It's just going to get better from now. I'm going to try to come out with every week a new crazy person. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to start in place and therefore if you do follow me on this you can follow me where I everywhere I stop so next week it'd be here then if next week it'd be where I stop the next day from 11th 12th 13th so on so on so on anyhow thank you for listening sergeant awesome out